uh, so to start off the, uh, the session, we're going to have uh, Vincent Lindsay as our first speaker. Um, so, so Vincent is originally from uh, Montreal in Canada. He did his PhD with Andrew Charette and then went on to do a postdoc with Richmond Sarpa. Uh, and then in uh, 2016, he began his independent career at NC State University. And he's, he's done some really interesting work related to new methodology involving strain carbocycles driving these reactions. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to the talk in anti-selective synthesis of modular cyclopropane equivalents and applications as highly strained building blocks. Welcome, Vincent. All right. Thanks, you for the nice introduction. I appreciate and I also appreciate the opportunity to uh, be here today and talk to you about some of our chemistry that we've done at NC State University. Uh, specifically about the chemistry of cyclopropanones. Uh, but before I do that, since it's the alumni edition, I thought I had uh, one slide uh, to tell you about some of the work that I had done as a postdoctoral member in the Sarpong lab. And as a lab that is specialized in the synthesis of alkaloids, of course, uh, some of the CH functionalization reaction that we're most interested in are intramolecular uh, CH functionalization. So one of the methods that we developed involved the use of these uh, sulfonyl triazole in an intramolecular CH uh, insertion reaction catalyzed by rhodium. And then we can use a dependent amine here uh, to close another ring to lead to n tricycles as shown here. I also worked a little bit in total synthesis uh, during my postdoc. We were interested in the synthesis of Magellaninone. Um, and as a key step, we thought we could do uh, C3 uh, age functionalization of a pyridine uh, using a method that was developed in the U lab at the time. Um, and so we made this intermediate uh, pretty rapidly. Uh, you know, like, uh, like a lot of challenges in total synthesis, this does not work well, uh, uh, unfortunately, because of all the functionalities in this uh, molecule. So that took us to a different path uh, where we uncover new uh, rearrangement uh, namely an oxidation mine wall rearrangement sequence that led to a cyclopropane. Uh, that we uh, would use later on for vinyl cyclopropane, cyclopentene rearrangement. Uh, but the work that we do in my lab here at NC State is divided into two main programs. Uh, the first of which is the development of a novel bifunctional catalyst, more specifically these imidazolyl metal species that uh, as a second functionality in the ligand that help the metal during the catalysis uh, to achieve very high uh, turnover numbers for sustainable cross-coupling reaction and also help to direct the regional control for CH functionalization reaction. Uh, but one of the projects that really took more expansion in the last few years in my lab is the chemistry of cyclopropanone and more specifically the use of sulfonyl cyclopropanols as really well-behaved equivalent of cyclopropanones uh, in order to uh, achieve new synthetic disconnection, either keeping the cyclopropane ring intact by more classical disconnection or uh, through ring expansion methods to lead to four or five membered ring as well as fused heterocycles uh, or by ring opening reaction to lead to new uh, deconstruction strategies. So this is what I wanna tell you about today. Um, and so, the way I had the, uh, we had this idea at the beginning is by looking at all the diverse chemistry that is already known with cyclobutanone, where you can do formal four plus one or four plus two cycloaddition to lead, lead to ring enlarge a uh, compound like five or six membered ring, either using classical chemistry or more uh, modern CC activation methods that were uh, developed in the Murakami and Don lab. Um, another example is shown here where you can do a classical semi-pinnacle rearrangement to lead to a spirocycle shown here, and that was used as a key step in a total synthesis of Frederica mycin A. And so we really wondered, um, since the cyclobutanone chemistry is so widely used in synthesis, why not cyclopropanones? Because when you look at the strain energies of cyclobutane and cyclopropane, these have about the same strain energy of around 27 or 28 kcal per mole. So naively, you would think that cyclopropanone and cyclobutanone uh, could lead to similar types of disconnection. But in fact, when you add a ketone to these compounds, there's really a huge difference in terms of stability and strain energy. 
uh, where in the case of cyclobutanone, which are stable and a lot of them are commercially available, this is about 29 kcal per mole. But in the case of cyclopropanone, that goes up to 49 kcal per mole. Uh, and indeed, so this is highly unstable. You can make cyclopropanone by this method uh, that was developed in the 60s by Turo and Hammond using ketene and diazomethane. Although you have to distill this compound at minus 78 and use it right away. Uh, otherwise, it will rapidly polymerize, which is the main decomposition pathway in this chemistry and really what we have to fight. Um, other decomposition pathways that are possible, depending on the substitution pattern, includes the light-induced uh, decarbonylation reaction or Favorsky-type uh, ring opening to acyclic esters like this. And so because these are so unstable and difficult to handle, what people do when they really want to use cyclopropanone as a building block is they will use an adduct uh, that will get transformed to cyclopropanone in situ to an, uh, an alpha elimination uh, reaction. And the most popular uh, of these uh, cyclopropanone precursors is this hemiketal shown here that was popularized by Wasserman in the 1960s. Uh, although this uh, does not work very well generally, first of all, the Ethoxide here is not a very good leaving group, and we're forming uh, something very high in energy. So you need some pretty harsh condition to trigger that equilibrium. Uh, and in presence of a, such an unstable compound, that leads to very low yield of desired rearranged product most of the time. Also, this same compound is known under basic condition to ring open to a metal homoenolate species, which is very practical in, the, in this field of model metal homoenolate chemistry, but if you want to use it as an actual cyclopropanone equivalent, uh, this is going to compete with your desired pathway. And a key paper for us uh, came out in 2008 where uh, Chen and his group uh, reported that sulfonyl cyclopropanol uh, shown here was a very stable and crystalline compound, but most importantly was equilibrating to cyclopropanone under very mild condition, under weekly basic condition at room temperature. And so uh, one of the only reported application at the time uh, was this reaction in water at room temperature using an amine and a gold catalyst as well as an alkyne to form these compound in decent yield. And so uh, after working in my lab with different cyclopropanone precursor, we really saw that there was a lot of potential with these compound and not much was being done with them. And we thought we could take advantage of this to uh, invent new uh, synthetic disconnection. And so the first thing we did is uh, develop a general method to uh, uh, access unsubstituted achiral version of these compounds. So starting from commercially available uh, silyl oxyketal shown here, we can cleave the silyl group uh, on these compounds and in one pot, uh, simply add the sulfonate salt as well as formic acid and water. Um, and that leads to these compounds in, in pretty good yield most of the time. Uh, this is all done in one pot and can be run on a gram scale. and, and Interestingly, it doesn't need any purification, so only a simple workup gives the pure compound right away. And so uh, we can uh, access a wide range uh, of, of these compounds with different leaving groups, so either with an electron donating or electron withdrawing group at uh, these positions. Our, uh, you, we can have uh, alkyl groups as well. And one of the reasons why we did so many of these is that we wanted to evaluate their propensity to uh, equilibrate to cyclopropanone and see if we could control that equilibrium. And so in order to measure that, we uh, look at the kinetic study of a, a, a pyrazole trapping reaction that we had developed, uh, where in this case, the equilibration to cyclopropanone is the slow step, while the addition of pyrazole is very fast. And so if we follow this reaction by an MR, that should give us an, uh, an idea of their relative propensity to equilibrate to cyclopropanone. And indeed, we saw that there was really a huge effect of the R group here uh, to the equilibrium constant to cyclopropanone, where electron-rich uh, aromatic sulfone uh, uh, leads to a lot slower reaction compared to electron-poor uh, para-CF3 or para-nitro derivative, for example. So that's uh, for the electronic effect. Uh, but there's also a steric effect where, for example, if you got a tributyl sulfone that will equilibrate to cyclopropanone a lot faster than a, a methyl sulfone, uh, simply because you have a more Pitzer strain release during that alpha elimination when you have a hindered group at this position. And so we can really access a wide range of equilibrium constant depending on the leaving group that we choose on uh, the sulfonyl cyclopropanol. And this is really important because as I told you earlier, uh, one of the main decomposition pathways that we're fighting in this chemistry 
is the polymerization of cyclopropanone. And so we want to minimize the concentration of cyclopropanone at all times in solution. So every time we want to develop a new uh, reaction, we need to be able to adjust the equilibrium constant and, and match this, uh, this constant to uh, the uh, constant of the desired reaction. So we need to be able to modify this equilibrium constant at will. Now, all of these compounds are precursors of achiral unsubstituted cyclopropanone. And so we really wonder, can we access an end to enriched version of these compounds? And by looking at the literature, we found that there's really uh, no general route to an end to enriched cyclopropanone, surprisingly. And so the best way that we found uh, to do this was to use uh, known methods from the literature to access an end to enriched sulfonyl cyclopropanes, either starting from a metal phenyl sulfone or a diazole sulfone shown here, and develop a, an alpha hydroxylation reaction um, to lead to an end to enriched sulfonyl cyclopropanol. Now, hydroxylation of sulfone is really not a common disconnection in synthesis. And so we really had to uh, develop our own uh, method here and optimize this reaction. Uh, where you know one of the challenges that uh, that we had is that these compounds are unstable to base. They will equilibrate to cyclopropanone under basic condition, but the hydroxylation of sulfone required base absolutely. And so we need to be able to run this reaction at minus 78 and having a powerful enough oxidant uh, to react at minus 78 and as uh, then quench the reaction at minus 78 uh, to freeze this compound in the protonated form. And so we found these uh, specialized condition and we're able to access a wide range of aromatic derivative as well as aliphatic substituted derivative. A CF3 and more congested substrate are also possible as well as a bicyclic derivative, which are interesting when you think about the Favorsky rearrangement. Uh, well, these are typical uh, Favorsky rearrangement intermediate that are kind of frozen in time as a sulfonyl cyclopropanol. Um, so this reaction has an, an unusual uh, hydroxylation mechanism. And the way we discovered that is uh, when we did the optimization, we really uh, found out that we needed absolutely a BF3 uh, type of Lewis acid, or at least a boron Lewis acid for the reaction to work. And this needed to be added before the oxidant itself. Otherwise, the reaction wouldn't work well. And so the presumed mechanism is uh, the following. So we first deprotonate the sulfonyl cyclopropane that reacts with the BF3 to form a lithium trifluoroborate that will then lose a fluoride ion to cleave one of the silo group of the oxidant. These two species can then recombine and after a one two shift and uh, protonation, uh, we're able to uh, access uh, the cyclopropanol. Um, and the way uh, that we know that this uh, is the effective mechanism is if you replace the oxidant by a bis silo a pinnacle region instead, you can isolate the corresponding uh, pinnacle boron region, uh, showing that we really form a carbon boron bond before forming the carbon uh, oxygen bond. And uh, so we can run this whole sequence on gram scale efficiently. So this is how we make uh, one of our substrates. So starting from phenyl methyl sulfone, you can buy this epoxide in an into a pure form. So it's relatively cheap. Uh, and you can do a sequential uh, uh, nucleophilic substitution reaction under these conditions to access the sulfonyl cyclopropane in decent yield on gram scale. And by applying our hydroxylation uh, condition, uh, we can get 80% yield and more than 99% uh, for this uh, cyclopropanone precursor. Now, in order to access more uh, uh, derivatives of, of these. Uh, we have now a more divergent approach starting from hypochlorohydrin, which is a really a great source of chirality. And so it's really cheap and it's an end to enriched form as shown here. And so if you simply add a cuprate to this epoxide that leads to a, an alcohol like this that can cyclize to form another epoxide uh, that can be used for the same sequence I just showed you up there. And so if you wanna modify the R group at this position, you just have to choose a different Grignard in the first step here. And so now that we have access for the first time to an into enriched uh, and modular cyclopropanone equivalent, uh, it was time to develop a new synthetic disconnection using these compounds, uh, either using more classical chemistry like Grignard addition to lead to cyclopropanols or Wittig uh, to lead to alkylidine cyclopropanes, but uh, also more modern uh, reaction like CC activation, uh, formal three plus one cycloaddition, as well as uh, oxidative ring openings. 
So I'm going to give you an overview of, of these methods that we developed so far. Um, so last year, we were able to uh, develop this uh, granular addition reaction that looks simple at first, but uh, remember that every time that uh, we develop a new reaction here, we have to control the equilibrium leading to cyclopropanol. And so um, this uh, demanded quite a bit of optimization and was developed by Roger Machine in my lab. Um, and so we have three different methods uh, for this to access tertiary cyclopropanols. Either you can use a, an excess of Grignard where one equivalent is used as a base to equilibrate to cyclopropanone. If your Grignard is more expensive, you can also use methyl Grignard as a sacrificial base at minus 78. And for alkyl nucleophiles, uh, it's better to use zincates while uh, the use of alkyl Grignard don't work really well. And so with that, we can access either electron rich or electron poor uh, tertiary cyclopropanol as shown here, as well as uh, sterically hindered derivative are, are, are work very well in this reaction. And most importantly, we can access chiral uh, tertiary cyclopropanol, which are very difficult to access by other methods, uh, namely the Kalinkovich cyclopropanation, for example. And recently, we we're able to find that uh, uh, you can also have a pyridine derivative adding to the cyclopropanol and moderate yields. Uh, another classical reaction you can think of doing is a Wittig reaction. Now, once again, this demanded quite a bit of optimization. I'll keep these conditions vague because this is still an unpublished result. Uh, but you can uh, access enantio-enrich uh, uh, electron-poor alkylidine cyclopropane in enantio-enrich form through this approach. Uh, the problem with this reaction is the DR, uh, where we cannot really control the uh, stereochemistry of that double bond very well. And so in order to get around that, what you can do is add a nucleophile uh, to this electron poor alkene to lead to uh, beta amino acid derivatives. Uh, for example, you can also use uh, glycine or homoglycine uh, nucleophile, and that leads to uh, peptide or dipeptide type of products as shown here. Um, another uh, reaction we thought uh, of doing here uh, is inserting a nitrogen inside the three-membered ring, and that would lead to beta lactam, especially these four chiral beta lactams that are difficult to access otherwise. Um, so organoazide uh, did work a little bit in this reaction, but we found that uh, a milder approach that would lead to a higher yield uh, was to use uh, a hydroxylamine as a nitrine equivalent under these conditions right here. Uh, you form first the hemiaminal that can rearrange to a one-two shift under a Lewis acid condition. And so you can use either the free hydroxylamine, the obenzyl hydroxylamine, or the HCl salt, uh, depending on the commercial availability. All of these work well, and you, can, you just need to adjust the conditions a little bit. Um, and so aliphatic hydroxylamine work well, as well as aromatic ones. Uh, the yield goes up when you use a chiral uh, substituted cyclopropanone equivalent uh, and you can get full regio control in terms of the one-two shift for these four chiral beta lactams. And so if you use an enantio rich substrate, uh, you can run this reaction on gram scale and obtain full um, transfer of the stereochemical information to the corresponding beta lactam here. Uh, following this, uh, we also wanted to insert a carbon in a, in a three-membered ring, and that would lead to a cyclobutanone. Um, so we first uh, started by a regular carbene equivalents like diazo compound, but these did not work so well in our, in our hands. Uh, but what did work well is more classical chemistry using our own uh, Grignard addition. So you, if you add a vinyl Grignard, uh, that leads you to uh, an allylic alcohol that you can use crude. Treat that with NBS to form the bromonium that will rearrange uh, through a one-two shift. And after elimination, that leads to an alkylidine cyclobutanone in an enantio enriched form. And so that works well for different substituted derivatives, as well as substituted Grignard uh, derivatives as well, um, as shown here. If you use an alkynyl Grignard instead, uh, what you get after this sequence is a bromoalkene that you can use in a subsequent Suzuki cross-coupling reaction. Uh, uh, this is relevant because, for example, here we had a nester that which we could not use in our Grignard addition, uh, obviously. And if you have a one uh, a substituent at the one position of the Grignard, that leads after the sequence to an all carbon quaternary center and, and very good enantial selectivity uh, with dependent neopentylic bromide group here. And so the same uh, allylic alcohol can also undergo other types of ring expansion. 
And so if you use our sequence I showed you earlier, what you get first is the alkylidine cyclobutanone. But if you add a Lewis acid to that, uh, the succinamide that was liberated in the first step from the NBS can reattack to form a beta amino ketone as shown here. If you use HCL to protonate the double bond, that leads to a saturated uh, cyclobutanone. MCPBA can also be used to epoxidize this alkene to trigger this rearrangement. And if you have two equivalent of MCPBA, that just continues on uh, to, do a, to make a fire member ring through a bayer villiger uh, oxidation type reaction. Another type of uh, ring expansion reaction uh, that we wanted to explore was is the CC activation of cyclopropanone. So there's a lot of chemistry done with CC activation of cyclobutanone, but this is actually the first a CC activation of cyclopropanone where we can insert an alkyne inside a three-membered ring to form cyclopentenone. And so one of the great features of this reaction, it gives a full regio control uh, with reverse pause and can selectivity where the large group of the alkyne is located at the three position, while in classical pause and can chemistry, you'll get this large group at the two position here. And so all of these reactions I've so shown you so far uh, go by the formation of an anion at this position that will undergo alpha elimination to form cyclopropanone. Uh, but we're, we really wonder what would happen if we form a radical at this position instead uh, to eventually lead to a ring open compound or, or better functionalized um, a carboxylic acid derivative as shown here. And so this type of chemistry is pretty well known for cyclopropanols. Uh, leading to beta fluoroketones. And so if we do this uh, reaction under the same condition with our cyclopropanone precursor, after hydrolysis of the species, what we get is a beta fluorocarboxylic acid. So in order to have a more divergent approach to lead to different uh, carboxylic acid derivatives, what we thought of doing uh, was to do a pyrazole addition uh, that we use for our kinetic studies and using the same adduct in the fluorination reaction that leads to an acyl pyrazole, which is already known to be a versatile electrophile in nucleophilic addition. And eventually that leads to a three carbon linchpin li uh, linking a nucleophile and a fluoride uh, together to lead to acyclic, uh, you know, beta fluorocarboxylic acid derivatives. And so a different substitution around the ring is possible in this reaction. And so we're working in racemic mode here because it's a radical ring opening. Of course, if we start from an electron rich, uh, our, uh, uh, an enzo-enriched an uh, uh, cyclopropanone equivalent, we're going to end up with a racemic product. And so we have to work in racemic mode here. But nevertheless, it works with a, a quite a bit of range of substitution to lead to a bit of fluorocarboxylic acid derivatives that are difficult to access by conjugate addition, because typically this is a reversible reaction that is directed towards the alpha beta unsaturated uh, compound. And so you can also use alcohols as nucleophile as well as, as hydride, and that leads to the corresponding alcohol. And so instead of fluorination, you can also do this with chlorination chemistry as well as iodination as well. Um, and so this uh, brings us to uh, the end of my talk. And so I hope I've been able to convince you that these sulfonyl cyclopropanol are really uh, versatile uh, synthetic intermediates. And I want to thank uh, my group, of course, for their hard work on this. You've seen the names at the bottom of the slide. Eugen, Myungi, Roger, and Chris have all worked really hard to develop each of these reactions, as well as the, uh, the initial study of learning how these compounds work. And so I'm really happy uh, uh, to be here at NC State. And thanks again um, for the invitation. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions in the chat. Okay, thanks very much, Vincent. Now let's see if I can get my menti going. And um, how do we get the menti going? Um, that's better. Thank you. Yes, please join me and thank uh, Vincent for a great talk. Okay, uh, Vincent, uh, there's quite a few questions in the chat. I'm just going to ask one to, to you now. Um, this is from John Tomlin, and he says, asks for the 2011 2012 papers. Did non-boron-based Lewis acids work but gave low yields, or did only boron Lewis acids provide any conversion to the cyclopropanol? Um, there was still some yield without the boron Lewis acid, but the yields were less than 10-15%. 
Um, and so if you use more reactive oxazoridines, for example, that, that seems to work a little bit, uh, but these were kind of stoichiometric, pretty specialized region. And so it's possible to do a direct hydroxylation as well. It's just, we couldn't really get a decent yield with that. And so, uh, yeah, while we were optimizing really the, you know, if we come, all the other Lewis acid didn't work at all. And it's really only the boron Lewis acid that worked. Okay, great. Well, please, everyone, please join me and Menti to, to thank Vincent for a great talk. And uh, Vincent, there are some additional questions in the chat that hopefully you can follow up on. Of course. Thank you. Thanks very much.